Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Frick Art Reference Library webinar, Writing About Art for Beginners. My name is Eugenie Fortier, and I'm the storage and retrieval lead for the Access Department of the Library. Joining me today is Corey Hutchinson, Interlibrary Loan and Document Delivery Assistant, who will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the program. Hi, all. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Thank you, Corey. Live captioning is available for this program. You can enable their display by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. This program will serve as an introduction to writing about art, starting from the work of art itself. We will discuss visual description as the basis at the beginning of the presentation, from which we will proceed to cover additional types of analyses and approaches that can be used to writing about art. Schedule for today is to start with an overview of formal analysis, proceed to stylistic and contextual analyses, and wrap up with beginning research and writing tips. We will also have a Q&A at the end of the session. As a disclaimer, I would like to note that this program will use examples of paintings and sculptures that fall within the library's general collecting scope, which is art of the Western tradition, such as paintings, drawings, and sculptures, from the 4th to the mid-20th century current era. Some resources listed at the end of the session have a broader scope and cover contemporary art, film, and performance art, as well as art from cultures outside the Western tradition. Please note, however, that many of the ways to approach observing, interpreting, and writing about art covered in this session are universally applicable. The goals for today are to understand the benefits of writing about art, to gain an introduction to formal analysis, to identify different approaches to interpreting and writing about art, to learn how to begin research using reputable sources, and to become familiar with writing tips. So why write about art? Writing about art translates a visual medium into a written one. It helps us communicate ideas and feelings about art. Writing about art can inform the reader and or persuade them of a certain point of view. As an interpretive process, it allows both the reader and the writer to gain a greater understanding of the impact and meaning of art thus leading to greater appreciation of the work of art. Since writing about art often includes contextualization, it can also serve as a lens to explore different moments in history. Overall, writing about art allows us to explore both the explicit and the implicit meaning of a work of art. Using The Still Life by Clara Peters as an example, the explicit meaning is what is readily observable. A bouquet of flowers in a vase with some flowers that have fallen onto a ledge Implicitly, however, this work is considered a vanitas painting, a reminder of the ephemerality of life. Since the flowers depicted here are the bouncy of Dutch colonial trade and thus were markers of wealth, for instance, tulips were imported from present day Turkey to the Netherlands, the painting could be interpreted to have a moral and possible religious message, reminding the viewer that material wealth is fleeting and to prioritize faith. Historically, up through the 19th century, descriptions of work, works of art have resembled these quotes. The first being, we recoil with the terrified infant who averts his eyes from the soldier whose heart is as hard as his burnished armor. And the second considers this painting on the right by Corot, which states, see now how evening from the mount descends, the shadow darker grows and wider too. The sky wears citrus tones on greenish hue. Scarcely enough daylight remains to see your name, Corot, so modestly inscribed. Akphrasis, from the Greek word for description, attempts to relay the sensation evoked by the object. It is not uncommon to come across written, written descriptions of arts that have a literary flair, as in these examples. The use of akphrasis could be attributed to limited resources and costs for visual reproductions of works of art. In lieu of such reproductions, writers attempted to recreate being in the object's presence. Ekphrasis thus often comments on presumed emotions of the viewer and that of the figures in a work as though they were in dialogue with each other, 
and with the viewer. Here's a lengthier example of exorcist. Uh, concerning the painting, Slave Ship, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying, Typhoon Coming On by J.M.W. Turner. Here John Ruskin writes in Modern Painters in 1843 about the sensation of being in front of this painting. Note the use of adverbs and adjectives here. They're quite abundant. Um, about halfway down, we can see that he describes the waves as they do not rise everywhere, but three or four of them together in wild groups, fitfully and furiously, as the understrength of the swell compels or permits them, leaving between them treacherous spaces of level and whirling water, now lighted with green and lamp-like fire, now flashing back the gold of the declining sun, etc., etc. There's no mention of the ship in the middle left ground, uh, nor is there any mention of the context, the content of the image rather, except in a footnote in which he refers to the ship as a slaver throwing her slaves overboard. The near sea is encumbered with corpses. So here the drama is very well communicated, but not much else. The reader is unsure how to visualize this. Visual description, on the other hand, objectively relays what the viewer sees. It presents the reader with facts about the work, but does not include the writer's thoughts or reflectiveness about the work of art. It's essentially what anyone might see in a work of art, so no inferences are made and no evaluation of the work is made as well. It's very literal and direct in relaying what the artwork shows. Ultimately, it mentions what the artwork is as in the mention of the explicit meaning of the still life mentioned at the start of this program. Starting with uh, Edward Monk's Starry Night, we can see that there are gestural strokes in the sky and that this is clearly a watery landscape in which the dark starry, starry sky is reflected in the water. But we can't make assumptions about what this abstract mound in the middle ground on the right is, nor what this rectilinear form that juts into the picture plane from the lower right corner might be. A formal analysis strikes the balance between ekphrasis and visual description. It relies on the description of the work while also communicating the viewer's impression of the work, allowing them to relay their personal experience. Formal analysis uses the visual description of the work of art to then make an interpretive claim about the cause and effect in a work of art. So the starting points of formal analysis are the artist, title, date, and medium. In the quote by Arneson and Mansfield on this slide, you'll note again the use of verbs um, and the use of uh, adjectives as well. But both the authors mention a lot of pictorial means by which this is achieved. And, and speaks of the combination of the feelings that are created in relation to these pictorial elements. It reads, Cassatt's print, Women's Bathing, presents a humble subject, which she animates through the, strong, the play of strong contour line and surface patterning. The figure's boldly striped garment energizes the floral pattern of the carpets, with both surfaces merging into a single plane. Traditional perspectival space is here abandoned in favor of color, line, and form, arranged for the benefit of visual harmony rather than documentary information. So ultimately, a formal analysis mentions what the artwork does and contains more of its implicit meaning. Generally, visual description or formal analysis should address the overall work of art before going into the details. It can begin by identifying a visual approach as such as whether a work of art is representative or abstract. Representative art is either naturalistic or realistic, it, but it can also be stylized or idealized. As in the example of this bust by Malvina Hoffman, we can see that they can be combined, that realistic and idealized elements can be combined in one work of art. 
The features of Ms. Frick here are very realistic in that she is identifiable as Ms. Frick. However, she wears this Grecian-inspired gown with a low neckline and flowers at the bust, something that Ms. Frick would have never worn, thus making her a more idealized figure. Similarly, if we look at the image to the right of this, attributed to Miskin, we see a landscape that doesn't have necessarily a realistic progression of space, but we can see that we can read it as such from the picture plane's bottom to the top. We also see that the scale of the figures doesn't really change, but we can still see the understand the narrative that is being presented here. Abstract art um, can either be based on observations of the world and or a recognizable subject presented in a novel or unfamiliar fashion, often through simplified forms, as in the Mondrian here, second from the right, in which he turns a tree into a series of lines in an inverted triangular form. Abstract art can also be non-representative, also called non-objective, independent of a visual reference in the world around us. An example of this is the Malevich on the far right. These categories are not necessarily exclusive. An artwork can be representative with abstract elements, as in the rock forms in the Miskin landscape that we previously looked at, or non-objective with an illusionistic recession in space. In reading the title of the Malevich, we can see that he titled it Painterly Realism of a Football Player, color masses in the fourth dimension, we can start to view the forms as if they are receding in space, whether he meant for this to happen or not, uh, towards the green dot at the bottom of the picture plane. Note that abstract art is often the catch-all for both abstracted representations of scenes from real life and for non-objective works. Formal analysis can be done through direct observation and can be clarified by the museum label, as we just noticed with the uh, consideration of the title of the work. How you read a work will factor into your formal analysis, but it is and can be subjective. These kinds of visual approaches can also exist on a spectrum from naturalism to abstraction, and within representative works, they can vary from realism to idealization. Realism is fidelity to appearances or the accurate rendition of the surfaces of people, places, and things, whereas idealization adheres more so to beauty norms of the time. Naturalism is something that we can imagine being in everyday life, whereas abstraction is more removed from that, something that is not as easily imagined or as a scene in everyday life. Note that these terms are not synonymous with the art movements, naturalism and realism, which are typically capitalized in texts. Now working from the general observations first, something else to consider is the content of the work of art. What is the subject matter? Is the work a portrait, a landscape, a narrative, a still life, or an abstraction? What does the work portray? Does the title help you interpret what you see? What is the work's general relation to the title, keeping in mind that it might not be the original title? Looking at this Manny Gillette painting on the bottom of the slide, titled The Composition Sea Rhythm, how might you interpret this work if it was called Thunderstorm or Dream? After establishing the visual approach and the content, formal analysis looks at how the elements create form in the composition. Listed on the left here are the elements of works of art, which can help you interpret and communicate what you see. The interaction between the elements creates the principles within a composition. In considering these elements and principles, you may begin to think about preliminary questions that you have about the work, which can be used to formulate a thesis and will be covered later in this program. So looking at the sudden shower over Ohashi Bridge in Atake by Hiroshiga, let's examine the elements of art that are used here. 
Let's look at the line. Is it directional, guiding the eye around the composition? Is it implied? Is it continuous or dotted, curvilinear or straight? In terms of color, is it monochromatic? Is there a limited palette? Are the colors complementary on opposite sides of the color wheel or analogous next to each other on the color wheel? How is form created? Is shape clearly demarcated or is it vague? In terms of texture, is there a smooth or a rough surface? In a two-dimensional work, is the visual effect of a certain texture created? Concerning size, how do different aspects of the visual forms relate to each other? Are they proportional? Are the sizes of certain objects realistically depicted in the composition? How does the size of the work relate to the viewer? Is it monumental and encompassing the viewer? Or is it small, inviting private contemplation? Considering perspective, is it linear in which orthogonal lines lead to a single vanishing point? Or is it atmospheric where the values of color become lighter and forms become less detailed to mimic a recession in space? How is light depicted? Is there a strong light source or is it more dilute and evenly distributed throughout the composition? Is the space illusionistic? How is negative space used? And lastly, does the work appear to have a certain amount of weight to it or mass? Does it appear to be light? How does this relate to the materials used for its construction? So concerning these elements, let's look at how they may contribute to the principles that are listed on the right. There's a cause and effect relationship for many of these um, and the elements combine and relate to these principles. The principles also can be combined and refer to each other, um, such as the emphasis of the directional line created by the repetition of the rain. Uh, it is also something that creates a rhythm and a movement, as well as a pattern <laughs> to the composition. There's repetition in the supports of the bridge as well. The composition is balanced by having a ver uh, vit vertical symmetry between the coastline and the bridge, which seem to merge together on the right outside the picture plane. In terms of proportion, uh, the space is flattened by the size of the middle ground figure on the boat being slightly larger than one would expect in relation to the size of the figures on the bridge. Concerning contrast, uh, the signature of the artist is contrasting the blues and the beiges of the composition. And uh, perspective is uh, more atmospheric in that the shapes become less demarcated as we look farther back towards the coastline and see these small boats that are basically just shadows on the right middle ground. There's also a sense of unity that's created, not only by this repetition of the straight lines that represent the rain, but also by the dark areas representing the clouds and the deeper water. Experts suggest uh, practicing close looking before conducting a formal analysis. Suggestions for close looking include seeing the work in person if possible, even the highest quality rep reproductions cannot replace the experience of observing a work in person. Other than the general sensations evoked, um, for instance, by the scale of the work or by the aura of the work, as Walter Benjamin would say, aspects such as the tactility of the medium can be lost in a digitized version. An example could be the use of impasto paint or thickly applied paint. Since reproductions of two-dimensional works like paintings typically only show the front of the object, some aspects of the work may not be captured. This also goes for frames and bases of sculptures, which even if made by the artist are often excluded in their images as well. So in the absence of seeing a work in person, try to find the highest quality reproduction available. Also attempt to see if you can find 
uh, an image of the work in situ or where it currently is. Spend approximately 10 to 30 minutes looking at the work and return to the work after taking a break to see if you notice anything new with fresh eyes. Take notes on what you observe and make simple sketches to determine what are the main elements of the composition? What are the proportions? How is it structured? What do the physical properties, like the material and the size, and the form, like the composition and color, contribute? Also note that feelings are valid and speak to the tone and mood of the work. Practice investigating the formal properties of the work that contributes to your reaction as a viewer. Ultimately, try to explain your feelings, not just describe them. Some formal analysis writing tips are to work from the general to the specific details, as we did working through visual approach, then content, and then elements and principles. To revise by attempting to draw the image solely from your own description, and to show, not just tell what you see. And consider what your first response to the work was and why you think you were having this response. Try to relay this in your writing. Stylistic analysis bridges the formal analysis with contextual analysis. Style is a little bit difficult to pin down, but it's essentially the distinguishing characteristics from subject and composition to brushstroke for an artist, period, or culture. It looks at how form is created. It also looks at subject matter. Um, but in terms of form, is the artist's hand showing in terms of how the, the artwork was constructed, or is there a lack of the artist's hand? In looking at the Joshua Reynolds, Selena Lady Skipwith on the left, we can see the atmospheric sky was made with gestural brushstrokes. And the nosegay or the small bouquet in the bust of Selena is made with just a few dapples of pink paint. In comparison, the ribbons on the hat and the dress of this figure are almost realistic. You can't really see any of the brushstrokes rendering them uh, very naturalistic in comparison to the sky and the nosegay. So think about uh, style in relation to artistic movements, um, especially contemporary ones. And in terms of contemporaneous works by the artist that you are observing and throughout the artist's overall of or body of work. Consider style also with other art of the period and culture. To give you an idea of stylistic analysis, we can look at these two paintings by Henry Oswald Tanner, an American painter who worked in France starting in 1891. So there are, first off, very obvious differences in the subject matter. The Annunciation on the left shows Mary being visited by Gabriel the Angel, and despite the realism, the angel is represented by an orb of light. The painting on the right shows the sun during either dawn or dusk uh, it, with the sky uh, being these pinks and orange reflected in the water. Note how the sun painting has brush marks that are visible um, and the blurry edges that make the, the man-made objects render the marks, the structure is just slightly demarcated. There's a high contrast between the natural elements and the man-made ones um, in the bridge and the silhouetted pier um, and silhouetted images, rather buildings towards the back. There's, however, a luminosity in both, um, and they both share an asymmetrical composition in which the luminosity is primarily on the left of the composition, contrasted with a human element on the right. The impressionistic brushstroke in which we can see how the paint was applied on the right-hand side gives the illusion of a quickly captured changing light on the river, reflecting both the style and the subject matter of the impressionists just some 30 years later. 
Note in comparison the difference in paint handling in the image on the left, which has crisp outlines versus the loose visible brush strokes. There's a delineation of forms and a solidity of the modeling of the figure and the objects in the image compared to the almost ephemerality of those on the right. Note also the use of color. There's primary colors are primarily used in the enunciation. Um, the composition is primarily gold and yellow with red and blue, whereas analogous colors are mostly used in the image on the right with purples, pinks, and oranges. Note also the vastly different sizes of the works, which may be because they were intended for different audiences. The Annunciation was in the Paris Salon in 1898, and it was very well received. The Seine, however, was not as publicly displayed, and it's smaller, scarcely larger than a sheet of printer paper. So it reads as more private. Maybe this had something to do with Oswald Tanner's personal exploration of the medium of paint. There are also differences in context. Um, presumably, Oswald Tanner was on the Seine when he painted the image on the right, and he had just returned from a trip to Palestine and Egypt before painting the Annunciation, which may have informed the seemingly Middle Eastern inspired setting in which he places Mary. Used in tandem with formal analysis, contextual analysis can also be used in different ways. Formalism is intrinsic analysis that concerns the quality within the work. The text contextual analyses concern what is extrinsic to the work. So you, we can contextualize a work historically by looking at historical events that were surrounding it, as in um, the advent of Impressionism taking place about 30 years before the Oswald Tanner River scene. We can also look at political events to give it a political context. Um, an example of this would be De La Croix's Liberty Leading the People during the French Revolution. Um, there's also cultural context. So consider when, where, and why the work was made. Is there iconography or symbolism that is used that was typical of the period, as in the orb representing the angel visiting Mary? Are there habits of thought or, or particular religious beliefs that may lead to how an image is constructed to show a certain scene. In terms of social context, consider the status of the artist and the intended audience, as well as how the work was received at the time um, and any contemporaneous criticism. Biographical context is personal to the artist's lived experience. And this relates, as we were talking about Oswald Tanner, to events in the artist's life that may inform how they construct a work of art, um, as in his recent trips to Palestine and Egypt, informing the Annunciation. Economic context often relates to patronage um, and the status of the artist as well. A particularly interesting context to me is scientific context, um, which considers developments in the understanding of the subject, as in understandings of human anatomy and depicting figures, or developments in artistic medium, such as the creation of specific paint colors and acrylics, and the invention of photography. There's also aesthetic context, which considers the artist's technique and how it's changed over time, and aesthetic theory that was surrounding uh, the art world at this time. Just e as equally, how has all this changed over time to how it is interpreted or perceived today? Keep in mind that the work that you're seeing in a museum, say the Met in New York, may not have been created to be seen where it is now. You can use different kinds of contexts to explore art historical methodologies and theoretical viewpoints. Um, many of these strive to recover unknown or disavowed histories of artists that were previously marginalized. Socioeconomic contexts, or methodologies rather, focus on the ways that artists 
and artworks either reinforce or undermine the dominant socioeconomic power structures in a society. Feminist viewpoints criticize the male gaze and how often uh, women are perceived as passive objects of male desire in the art historical canon, as well as how art is upholding or undermining how women have been historically portrayed in works of art. And it also considers the opportunities or lack thereof that women artists had in comparison to their male counterparts. Critical race theory dissects the othering of anyone that falls outside the assumed majority of those of European descent who benefit from European power and prestige and white privilege. Postcolonial theory examines the complex political, economic, and cultural legacies of Western imperialism and colonialism. Queer theory challenges the ways that art history asks questions about gender identity and sexuality and how these factors intersect with race, class, and ethnicity. Considering these contexts, we can start to see how they're used and interwoven in something like a museum label. This museum label uh, is related to the work called Dwellings that is in the Frick Madison staircase um, and is owned by the Whitney. Uh, this piece was made in 1981, giving us a little bit of historical context. And there's a little bit of a form uh, description in its use of clay, sand, sticks, stones, wood, plaster, cloth, and chicken wire. Um, if we look at the museum label a little closer, we can see that there are several kinds of contexts, again, as I mentioned before. There's mentions the provenance, so who owns the work now, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. And it states that it was a permanent installation commissioned by the Whitney Museum of Art in 1981. So this gives us a little bit of the economic context as well. It speaks to the geographical context and telling us about the two clusters of small buildings atop clay hills, similar to those here, that are located across the street on a second story windowsill and chimney. There's a little bit of a biographical context as well, um, an aesthetic context in letting us know that in 1970, Simmons began making these miniature settlements that he described as dwelling places for an imaginary civilization of little people. There's again, a little bit of formal analysis in letting us know that these look seemingly abandoned by their inhabitants and resembling architectural ruins, evoking a particular time and place in the invented history of the little people that Simmons imagined. Again, there's a little bit more biographical information in saying that early in Simmons' career, the artist worked primarily in New York Soho and Lower East Side neighborhoods, constructing his sculptures in niches of the dilapidated brick apartments gutters, window ledges, and vacant lots. It uniquely lets us know, know that the works were vulnerable as well, which may speak to their eventual degradation over time, um, and how that underscores the ephemerality of every civilization, giving us a little bit more of the implicit meaning. Lastly, there's just a little bit more of geographic context um, and information about the artists and letting us know that during the last four decades, Simmons has built more than 300 structures in cities around the world, including Chicago, Houston, Paris, Berlin, and Shanghai. Based on the aforementioned types of analyses, you would have probably started to collect a few exploring uh, exploratory questions such as who, what, where, when, how, and why about the work of art. Conversations with friends or peers, uh, brainstorming, and or free writing can also help spark ideas. Just starting to write a rough draft can help generate ideas as well. Um, in trying to find context for your work of art, uh, trustworthy sources and authoritative sources are great starting points, including museum websites, which often have collection, 
databases um, in which works are specifically mentioned and discussed. There are also catalog raisonnés, which are comprehensive publications of an artist's body of work. Primary documents, uh, such as artist writings, which for very popular artists may have been published, and archives. Monographs published by university and or museum presses. And scholarly articles, which are usually found in databases. Of note also is that reference librarians can be of help um, in helping you start your research and refine your query, as well as start finding resources related to you, the information you're seeking. Uh, the Frick Art Reference Library offers virtual consulta consultations via Zoom um, that you can request by going to frick.org slash library. Citation chaining is a term to describe finding a relevant resource or publication and looking at the references to see what other relevant resources you might be able to find from that list of references and doing the same to eventually narrow down your topic of interest. Uh, proper note-taking methods include taking notes with full citations. Uh, in art history, the Modern Language Association or the Chicago Manual style are typically used. And you can use uh, citation softwares such as Zotero to help you construct those and keep track of them. Um, and you would also want to correctly distinguish quotes in your notes to avoid accidental plagiarism. This relates slightly more to academic writing, but in formulating a thesis, you would want to narrow down from a list of questions while conducting your research. Um, but remember to be adaptable and refine your thesis as your research is conducted. Ultimately, a thesis should make an argumentative statement that is interpretive and yet supported by credible sources. Essentially, it should be a statement that seems true to the work itself, that almost seems self-evident. And when the reader of the essay turns to look again at the object, they can see exactly what the writer means. A good thesis names the topic, makes a claim, determines the scope of the argument, and defines the structure for the arguments. And thus, an introductory paragraph should include the thesis and main supporting points. Ultimately, your thesis should answer the question, so what? Why should the reader care? Here are some writing tips to help, uh, again, with more academic writing, more formal writing. Uh, you would want to outline your paper and constantly return to your thesis as you are creating your outline and as you write. You may wish to collect images in advance to help elucidate your argument and see if you can find new patterns amongst the images. In constructing paragraphs, uh, present main ideas first and then support those ideas with evidence. Some notes on writing style include considering your audience. For instance, is this for an art historical audience or a broader audience? If it's for the latter, you may have to define your terms and provide more background information. Use active voice and consistent verb tenses. Generally, present tense is used when discussing what a work of art does, but past tense is used when mentioning the actions of the artist or moments in art history or in history in general. Compel the reader to look closer and reconsider the work. Don't assume the artist's intention and embrace uncertainty. It's perfectly fine to speculate as long as you have some kind of anchor to evidence, but also make it clear that you are speculating when you do. In revising your paper, it is an ongoing process, um, and you want to develop a critical eye by reading objectively. To do that, you can get some distance from your work and come back and see whether you fulfilled the assignment in length and in scope. Did you say what you intended to say? Think about what you have said versus what you have not said. Analyze your work by reading slowly and proofreading, 
reading aloud can help. And break down your arguments or idea into parts and ask yourself whether these parts support the paper as you envision it. Do you have ample evidence for your arguments? Do you see any holes in your arguments and is it convincing? And lastly, have you dealt fairly with opposition? Here are some references that might be helpful uh, to you in writing about art. Uh, note that there are also library guides called LibGuides that are produced both by libraries and museums alike on the internet that can provide great information about writing about art as we covered in this program. Here are some examples of art writing as well, two of which are available through our library catalog, uh, which will lead you to a digitized version. Um, these are typically combinations of formal analysis and different kinds of textual and contextual analyses. And we also have a list of examples of creative art writing, um, such as works of fiction that are inspired by works of art. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, there's an upcoming program in which participants will be asked to write a short fictional story in response to two works of art as prompts that are sent a week prior to the program uh, called Writing About Art for Beginners and Practice Short Stories in Three Weeks. Submissions will be circulated among the registered uh, participants for discussion during the program if you are interested. And this obviously re uh, refers more to the creative art writing that we spoke about during the references. At this time, Corey will drop an evaluation form in the chats, which uh, we would encourage you to fill out um, with further programming suggestions and um, any feedback that you would like to relay to the library. At this time, we'll happily take any questions. Hey, there's an excellent question in the chat, maybe to start us off, um, sure. which is if you use a source simply for citation chaining, um, as in using the source only to mine for further sources, do you have to cite that source? Technically, no, um, but I would say that having it in your list of references towards the end of um, so not citing it within the body of your text, but citing it in your references would be handy. Will, uh, will and when a recording be made available? In approximately two weeks, uh, we will share this on our YouTube page. So if you just check our uh, the Frick Collection YouTube page, uh, it should eventually pop up with uh, captioning as well. And perhaps an idea for um, a future program, but are there any suggestions for gearing your writing toward a general versus an art savvy audience? We have not uh, considered that, but that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, could you go over the fiction approach resources? Oh, sure. Um, so let me just go back to them. Uh, there are two called voices in the gallery. <laughs> um, one of the second of which is by the University of Rochester and has images throughout the book that um, the writers are have been inspired by. Uh, the Susi, the Stephen Susi publication is um, about four hundred pages long, so it's it's very uh, thorough in the inclusion of different kinds of short stories that are inspired by art. And uh, Transforming Vision, Writers on Arts, um, is probably the easiest to find in this um, and has, again, very great reproductions, all from the Institute, the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, someone was hoping that you could explain a little bit more about what to expect um, from the next event in this series. Sure. Um, so basically, we send out a PDF, which has tips for looking at art and two works of art, uh, one newer, so uh, from the 20th century onward, and one older, 
that is uh, probably around the time of the Renaissance. And you can pick one of those images or both and write a fictional um, short story about either one uh, or both, as I said. <laughs> um, and basically, you submit that via email to our library email address. We compile a PDF and circulate it to the participants. And it's essentially like a writing group where you have the opportunity to discuss your short stories amongst yourselves, as well as your impressions of the works of art. In addition to a lot of praise um, in the Q&A, there's a question about the best form to cite references found on a website. Oh, uh, hmm. there are different ways depending on whether it's a website or a blog. Um, I would recommend that you just search for the MLA style guide online, and then uh, they should have a section that defines or specifies how to cite websites. Another question um, is asking for examples of the types of topics um, that are discussed during library consultations um, at the Frick specifically. Sure, there's a wide array of them. Basically, any question that you have that's art historically related, uh, we're happy to help you field. Um, so anything from starting your research to whether you're stumped during your research at a certain point. Uh, we've gotten questions on how to approach finding a work of art when you only have a signature or um, tracing the provenance of a work of art is a popular one as well. Uh, but often it's just helping you compile resources as well. And um, the final question that I see in the Q&A right now is how often are museum, museum labels rewritten and is there a cycle for rewriting museum labels? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends on the institution and uh, especially if new research has been found on a work. I think that if a work has recently traveled to an exhibition where new information was found about it, the museum label might be uh, updated. Um, the Frick, however, does not really use museum labels. We have instead a an audio guide that is hosted by Bloomberg Connects. Um, and I know that those are repeatedly just continuously updated. Those are all the questions that I see at the moment. Thank you. Those were great questions. But I just want to say thank you all so much again for attending this webinar. Uh, please be sure to check our website at frick.org slash library for both upcoming programs and further information on the Frick Art Reference Library. We appreciate your attendance and your participation today. Thank you so much. Have a good day.